So let's look at fast and slow fading in digital mobile communications. And here we've got a base station uh, with the signal bouncing off some uh, houses, in this case in the drawing, uh, and coming to the receiver. And in this case, if there's two signals, let's just draw those signals. Uh, so this is going to be at the carrier waveform, a sinusoid, uh, and this is coming from uh, one of the paths, and then another path is coming with the delayed offset relative to that path. Okay, so that's going to be a delay of tor. Okay, so that's at the same frequency. Uh, it's just reflected off a building, which is a, means that the overall path is a delay of tor different. Okay, so the first point to make here uh, that is that the value tor changes at the speed of the mobile device. Okay, so if we've got a speed V for mobile device, then as this device moves, this time offset here will change at the rate that you are moving. So that's one important thing. So the speed of the mobile device is one of the important parameters. Okay, what about looking at the delay relative to the wavelength? So this is the wavelength, lambda, uh, and so we can see that if tor is significant in proportion to the wavelength, then you're going to have the chance that you have a complete cancellation. Uh, because if tor was equal to half a wavelength, then when these two waveforms add in the air, as they do, they would be cancelling each other out at the receiver. And if you move then to a position where they, it's exactly adding, then this means the channel gain is going up and down. And this is what we call fading. Okay, so if that delay is significant in relationship to the lambda as a percentage of lambda, uh, then when you get multiple paths, lots of these all adding up, then you're going to have more differences in path delays because they'll all have their own delay and they'll all be adding up, uh, adding constructively and deconstructively. And therefore, when you move, you'll have faster fading. There'll be more components fading. So as the number of paths, n paths, as the number of paths increases, uh, this implies that the fading happens faster. So that's faster fading from having more paths. Okay, that's the first thing to think about. Uh, another parameter, so that's one parameter, and we'll come back to that uh, in a minute. Another parameter is the carrier frequency, FC. So let's think about that for a minute. As the carrier frequency increases, the wavelength decreases because lambda times F equals a constant C. Uh, so the wavelength decreases as the carrier frequency goes up. And for the same fixed delay tor, and this is from the physical environment, the difference in these path lengths is the physical environment, so that won't change just by changing the carrier. So if we change the carrier, then this will be a bigger proportion of the wavelength because the wavelength is smaller. And therefore, when you move around, uh, this will affect that signal. The changes here will be more significant. So this means that you will have the uh, movements that you have will have a bigger lead to bigger phase spread. So let's I'll just draw that like that. So a bigger phase spread will go up, which means that you will have faster fading. OK, so these two parameters, when they go up, they, they relate to faster fading. Uh, what's another parameter? Well, let's think also about what happens uh, if you have uh, uh, that affects the fading. And that is that if a path, if you're moving in a direction that makes a path get shorter, so generally that's moving towards the receiver, or in a direction, if, the, if it's bounced off a path, you're moving in the direction of the path to make the path shorter, then the frequency of your signal goes up. There's a shift in frequency called the Doppler shift. If you're moving away so that the path gets longer, then there's a Doppler shift uh, in, that makes your frequency go down, your wavelength goes up. So if you've got movement, let me just put this here, MOV, movement towards, uh, which makes the path shorter, uh, then this implies the frequency goes up. This is the, the frequency of, of your uh, carrier here uh, in terms of when it, what it's going to be received as at the receiver. Movement away 
uh, implies the frequency goes down and together they are called a Doppler spread. And because you've got multiple paths, then some of them will be bouncing off things which are uh, in the direction of the receiver and some of them will be bouncing off uh, houses that are in the direction uh, away from uh, the uh, from the from the receiver. So if the receiver moves in this direction, uh, it will be making this path shorter, but it will be making this path longer. Okay, in a multi-path environment. So this gives you a Doppler spread. Okay, as the speed goes up, as v goes up, this velocity here, as v goes up, the Doppler spread will go up. Let's call that ds. The Doppler spread. The Doppler spread will go up. And as the Doppler spread goes up, well, let's let's just look at that a picture. That, uh, that, that indicates this, we'd have a waveform that's got a long uh, wavelength, uh, that's from the paths that are going away, and then if I draw an extreme case, uh, the paths, this is obviously very extreme that I've drawn, for if something's travelling very fast, uh, then the ones towards are going up in frequency, and so even if you're just simply adding these two together, even if the tor wasn't changing at all, and you're just simply adding these together, you're moving in some direction that magically makes the tor not change, these are still going to be adding in to each other in constructive and deconstructive ways as time goes on. And so just the very fact of movement is going to cause the Doppler spread, which causes time variations in the channel. So this implies faster fading. Okay, so we've got three ways to get faster fading. Uh, more paths, higher carrier frequency, and faster velocity. Okay, so this is a way to get the fading faster, but when is it fast? And when is it slow? When do you define it as being fast and slow? Well, it really needs to ask the question, fast and slow compared to what? And this is the thing that people often miss out on uh, when they're thinking about this. The, the, the key is it's faster or slower compared to the symbol rate. So we've got the symbol rate, TS. This is the rate at which we're going to send symbols. Okay, so if we had a channel which is varying because of all these additions and so on, uh, and let's say the channel gain is varying like this over time, uh, and this is the rate of change, I've drawn it here, then if we had a symbol rate which was very, very fast, let's say every one of these time slots here is a symbol, or even faster, there might be a thousand symbols between each of the ones that I've drawn here, then you could see that if there's, let's say there's a thousand in between every time slot that I've drawn here, then clearly the channel does not change very much in that time slot. So it might be that there's lots of paths and it might be a high carrier frequency and you might be traveling fast, but if you're sending symbols even faster than that at a very high rate, mega, bits, mega symbols per second or giga symbols per second, uh, then potentially, uh, depending on what these parameters are, it could still look like an almost constant channel. And this would be slow fading. Whereas if you had a symbol period which lasted for a long time, where you sent one symbol over, over all of that period of time and then you changed to the next digital symbol and so on, then clearly over this time here, the channel can have changed quite significantly. So even for the same parameters of the number of paths, the carrier frequency and the velocity of movement, depending on the symbol rate, it could be either fast or slow fading. And that's the important key, that it's relative to the symbol rate. So let's just uh, think of some uh, sort of classic examples here, or let, let's see what this uh, leads to here. So one general rule of thumb is that the, uh, the higher, if you're sending at a higher data rate, so a higher data rate, uh, it, it often means that you're sending at a higher symbol rate um, in, in classic uh, narrowband communications, let's just say that for a minute, we'll talk about OFDM just in a minute, but that relates to a higher uh, symbol rate. Uh, rate. Uh, this implies slow fading. So if you increase the symbol rate, increase the data rate, increase the symbol rate, you'll get slow fading. If you decrease, on the other hand, if you send slowly, then you will have, so if you send the data slowly, so if you send at a low uh, data rate, uh, and, and if you do that by sending at a low symbol rate, 
um, rate, then you get fast fading, which is sort of uh, often counterintuitive. People uh, don't quite understand why that is. But I think it's clear now, hopefully it's clear to you now, that if you're sending at a high symbol rate, then the channel doesn't have much time to change no matter what these parameters are. If you're sending at a low symbol rate, then the channel has lots of time to change, so it's going to be fast fading. Now, there's a couple of things that go hand in hand with this, and that is that if you're sending at a high symbol rate, then small delays here in the, uh, in the, uh, between the paths, small delays can mean that your symbols are going to overlap with each other in time. So slow fading often goes hand in hand with a channel that has inter-symbol interference. And fast fading often goes hand in hand with no uh, inter-symbol interference. So there's a benefit uh, of, of choosing one, is that maybe you, uh, you, you get a channel that's slow fading and therefore it's easy to track that channel and invert the channel at the receiver, except for the fact that the symbols are gonna merge with each other and you have inter-symbol interference. And for a video on inter-symbol interference, you can check out the link below this video. Uh, so slow fading typically has inter-symbol interference in mobile channels, fast fading typically no inter-symbol interference. And the, the um, one uh, um, counter example to that probably uh, is OFDM, and this is one of the main reasons for going to OFDM. So in OFDM, and there's videos on, in the links below about OFDM, but in OFDM uh, we take the high data rate symbol, so high data rate, uh, so high data rate gets split into lots of parallel low data rate s symbols. So it gets it made into, and this is in the frequency domain, so there's lots of parallel low data rate symbols or low symbol rate, low symbol rate, but in parallel. And then we send each one on a different carrier frequency using the discrete Fourier transform. And so in, in each symbol on each carrier frequency is taking a long time. It's just that they're being sent in parallel. But on each carrier frequency, it's going over a long period of time. Okay, so this is the, the difference with OFDM, uh, is that uh, you're going to have the, the, the faster fading, but you're going to have no inter-symbol interference. And in this case, it's you put in pilots to track the channel and you, you estimate the channel and you have to accept that it's fast fading, but you've got no inter-symbol interference. And it's harder to equalize inter-symbol interference uh, than it is to track the channel. And so OFDM uh, is a, an example where you're deliberately changing the, the rate so that you're sending at a low rate so that it becomes easier to equalize. Uh, if you found this video helpful, please like it. It helps others to find the video. And uh, check below for more links to other videos. And check out the webpage in the link below where there's a full categorized links of all the videos on the channel.